Hey guys, what's up? Tyler here. If there's any species in the Star Trek franchise that gets people real excited, it's the Klingons. A fascinating warrior race whose name recognition is on par with the Vulcans and the Romulans. The Klingons have been featured in just about every series of the franchise in several feature films. Their culture is also far more complex than what we often see on the surface, and they have a rich history and distinct biology that sets them apart from other species in the Star Trek Milky Way galaxy. Today I'll explore the Klingons' ancient origins and how their physiology has affected the development of their species. Like many of the other humanoid species in the Star Trek galaxy, the Klingons are thought to be descended from a genetic code uh, seeded by ancient humanoid progenitors four and a half billion years ago. We don't get a great close-up look at their sun in most media, but it appears to be roughly a K-type yellow-orange star, slightly dimmer than our sun and similar in brightness to the Vulcan sun. The Klingon sun's real-world equivalent has also not been identified thus far, but it's said to be near Omega Leonis, which is about 112 light years away. K-type stars are among the most stable in the universe and slightly longer lived than G-type stars like our sun, meaning there's more time for complex life to evolve in a relatively calm stellar radiation environment. This would have had a significant impact on the Klingons' early evolution, with redder wavelengths emitted by their star contributing to slightly weaker photosynthesis, which could have induced fiercer competition among primordial ancestors. But besides the influence of their sun, the Klingons' evolution would have been also largely driven by the volatile climactic conditions on their homeworld. Kronos. As we learn in Discovery, Kronos is home to a vast network of caves and subterranean volcanoes that produced intense geological activity in the ancient past. Kronos is depicted in some media as having a single supercontinent, but these are non-canon sources. As far as atmospheric conditions, Kronos also has uh, thick cloud layers and dense gases in the upper atmosphere that can block long-range scans. The planet is said to have chaotic weather systems marked by violent thunderstorms. Between this and the smaller amount of blue light output from their star, uh, this could be the reason that Kronos's sky is depicted as green in many appearances, as the atmosphere would scatter green wavelengths. But though the climate has likely changed over eons, uh, it's not hard to imagine that general shifts in the environment influenced important steps in Klingon evolution. The intermediary stages of Klingon evolution are not particularly well defined, except for one uh, glimpse that we do get in the Next Generation episode, Genesis, in which the Enterprise crew suffers from a virus that causes them to de-evolve. Now, at the risk of taking this episode too seriously, um, I just want to say that for years, the examples of de-evolution presented in this episode have bothered me substantially. Some of them make sense, like Picard and Riker and Nurse Ogawa transforming into proto-hominids and perhaps Troy regressing into an amphibian. But some of the other transformations, Barkley into a spider, Data's cat Spot into an iguana. Then there's Worf's transformation into a so-called proto-Klingon with an exoskeleton, mandibles and pinchers, and venomous sacs. Quite an interesting design indeed. This similarly used to bother me a bit, as I thought it looked like a leap and a bound beyond uh, what would be expected for a more human-looking than not humanoid species as far as their early ancestors, but I realized I just had to open my mind. Trek has historically not been great with evolution. Just see the Voyager episodes, Distant Origin, and uh, worse, Threshold. I'm not sure which one is the captain. The female, obviously. This de-evolved Klingon could be something that's not in the Klingon's direct evolutionary line, rather an example of a horizontal gene transfer mutation. Um, but on the other hand, maybe it's not so far-fetched. You see a land-dwelling predator that possesses these traits uh, that I mentioned earlier could still tell us a lot about early Klingon evolution. The lower jaw mandibles, for example, could have easily evolved into teeth. Uh, indeed, the faces of primates have changed over millions of years. It's even thought that an early therapsid proto-mammal cousin of ours uh, called Eucambergia, which lived about 255 million years ago, had venomous sacs as well. Open your mouth. A 
Additionally, the Klingon's forehead ridges, one of the traits that has made them iconic, are undoubtedly adapted as a result of mating rituals of primordial ancestors. The bony protrusions even form a part of the Klingon skull, which makes sense. In fact, the Klingon skeleton overall would have to be stronger, as would their muscles, to overcome the slightly higher surface gravity of their homeworld. The Klingon's forehead ridges, as they appeared in the motion picture onward, also distinguished them from their earlier appearances in the original series, which leads to a rather uncomfortable uh, conversation that involves genetic engineering. After first contact with humanity in the 2150s, Klingon scientists attempt to bioengineer enhanced warriors using DNA from augment embryos left over from the eugenics wars. This genetic engineering backfires and creates the so-called augment virus, <laughs> a plague that sweeps through the empire and causes uh, infected Klingons to lose their forehead ridges until a cure is developed a few decades later. This is the officially given explanation in the show for why Klingons in the original series lack their forehead ridges. Yes, an in-universe explanation for a real-world production limitation. Fun. In the DS9 episode Trials and Tribulations, when the Defiant crew travels back in time to stop an assassination plot against James T. Kirk, they see Klingons afflicted with the virus and look towards Worf. And Worf says, Would you not discuss it with outsiders? Maybe they should have left it at that. I feel like when Gene Roddenberry commissioned their makeup redesign for the motion picture, his intention uh, was that that's what they were always supposed to look like, but you know, what do I know? The matter of the Klingons' facial appearances is also something that became a point of controversy when Star Trek Discovery premiered. Before departing the show, uh, executive producer Brian Fuller who oversaw much of the early development of Discovery, was adamant about wanting to update the Klingon makeup design. In his words, the Klingons have never been consistent across uh, installments of Star Trek, a statement with truth to it, to be sure, and Fuller aimed to introduce several different houses with different styles. I think this approach was not totally unwarranted, as I've said before. Uh, variety in a species is not a negative, but a positive. That said, I've never really been a big fan of the changes made to the Klingons in Discovery. Among these changes are a grayer skin coloration as opposed to the more human looking skin tones of previous installments, the inclusion of talons at the ends of their fingers, and of course, their bald heads. Now, bald Klingons are nothing new. Uh, General Chang in the Undiscovered Country was bald. Ah, ah. <laughs> as were the Klingons featured in Star Trek Into Darkness, but Discovery took it to a whole other level. All things considered, I think that the decision to walk back the baldness in subsequent seasons of Discovery was the right decision. I get what they were going for originally, trying to make this alien species look more alien. But for a franchise with as much weight and history as Star Trek in the public consciousness, there's a certain expectation for what Klingons look like to most people, that failing to meet this criteria will of course leave people dissatisfied. Adding the hair back seems to be part of a possibly ongoing process of slowly retconning the Klingons in Discovery to look more similar to their other appearances. Using the Klingons as an analog for some of the West's historical adversaries, uh, for example the Soviet Union and or China uh, during the original series and early Next Generation era, uh, and perhaps jihadists in Discovery, means it makes sense uh, for them to be portrayed as an other, extending this otherness all the way to making them look monstrous. But given that Star Trek is a universe where many humanoid species still share a lot of fundamental similarities with us, including often uh, skin pigmentation, I think it's just as valid to portray them in a way that is more humanizing, so to speak. Not that there's anything wrong with introducing other skin colorations, uh, Takuma is certainly an imposing figure, and Volk being an albino Klingon and an outcast is definitely a creative character choice. But ironically, Discovery seems to have initially limited the variety more so than other installments. In addition to their external attributes, uh, Klingon's internal physiology is equally fascinating. One of the most significant aspects of their anatomy that sets them apart from other humanoid species is that they have multiple redundant organs, likely another feature that aids their survival in combat. Klingons are said or shown to have 23 ribs, 2 livers, an 8-chambered heart, 3 lungs, 
two stomachs, two urinary tracts. For sex. And extra neural tissue. This redundancy forms the basis of a principle called Brack Lull. Uh, some, including Bellana Torres, believe that these extra organs are entirely vestigial in nature. In the Voyager episode Lineage, uh, Torres wishes for the doctor to remove lines of DNA from her hybrid daughter's genetic code. But the doctor reminds her that while many of these uh, extra organs aren't necessarily essential for survival, they can confer some benefits outside of becoming a warrior, for example, in athletic competition. What if she develops an interest in athletics? Greater lung capacity would be an advantage. The point is, there's no reason to arbitrarily remove genetic traits. It's not arbitrary! Speaking of Klingon children, we are shown in various installments that the gestation period for uh, Klingon offspring is about 30 weeks, about a month and a half shorter than the human gestation period, though it can be shorter for hybrids of certain species. This is likely because of the sheer size of the Klingon's crania. Just as with human children, once the skull reaches a certain size, they've got to come out. Because of the larger brain casing in primates, our brain-to-body ratio being more conducive to intelligence, although this relationship is dubious, necessitates that after we are born, our parents must spend longer taking care of us than animals with longer gestation times. However, once Klingons are born, uh, they mature more quickly anyway. By one year, they're equivalent to a human four-year-old in maturity, and by the age of eight, they're equivalent to a human 16-year-old. This may be related to a faster revolution of their homeworld around their sun, although we don't really know how long a Klingon year actually is. But more likely, it's simply another adaptation to uh, the harsh conditions of their environment. Also, once they reach maturity, Klingons can live for about 150 years. The color of Klingon blood has also been depicted differently in different installments. Uh, while often it is shown being red while oxygenated under class and conditions, in the undiscovered country, in Discovery, uh, it's distinctly pink. The purpose of this pink blood, despite having been originally scripted for the undiscovered country as being red, was allegedly to appease rating systems, but also show up as distinctly alien. As I discussed in my video about the Asari from Mass Effect, the color of blood is in large part influenced by the type of protein present to facilitate oxygen transport. In humans and other vertebrates, this protein is hemoglobin, uh, which is iron-based, though the Vulcan's green blood is said to use a copper-based variant of hemoglobin. However, this is not the only protein available. In other Earth animals, particularly crustaceans, which the Klingon's primordial ancestor seen in Genesis seems to share some characteristics with, it's hemocyanin, which is usually blue but can be purple. Hemorrhythrin, found in some marine worms is also purple, but the crimson red color of the river Skrull, where Kalis defeated Molor in Klingon history, means that it's probably closer to our own blood than that of invertebrates. At the very least, it could be a mix of proteins, although the simplest explanation is that it's hemoglobin. There are numerous other additional factoids about Klingon biology, uh, that are mentioned in non-canon works, but one that really stuck out to me from the novel Pawns and Symbols is about Klingon vision. It is revealed in the source that Klingons are colorblind in the human sense, uh, being unable to distinguish between red and black. Furthermore, their vision is said to extend into the ultraviolet uh, to 32,000 angstroms. For reference, human vision includes wavelengths between 4,000 and 7,000 angstroms. Red-black color blindness is not a conventional form of color blindness uh, found in humans or other animals, but uh, it makes sense given that red can appear very dark under certain conditions. There's a reason, after all, that wavelengths that are longer than the ones in the visible spectrum are called infrared. The rod and cone cells that form the basis of our retinas usually absorb and are damaged by UV light in strong concentrations. But many Earth animals, uh, especially those that lack lenses, can see ultraviolet just fine. After all, Klingon cells, which evolved around a sun that may be dimmer than Sol, would need to absorb as much uh, wavelengths as they can to power their physiology. Uh, as would pigments found in plant life on Kronos. For more information about how the wavelengths of light from stars affect the pigments in life, see my videos about the Asari or 
Cardassians or the Orions below. Klingons are among the most formidable species in the galaxy. They're larger, they're stronger, they have more stamina than many other humanoid species. But besides their biology, it's also their rich history, culture, and imperial ambitions that make them such a force to be reckoned with on the interstellar stage. Clearly all the information that we know about the Klingons, and they are one of the most fleshed out species in Star Trek, can't fit into one 15 minute or so video such as this one. So let me know what other aspects of Klingon society you'd like me to focus on in future videos. I've got some ideas, but nevertheless, I'm all ears. Thank you all so much for watching. I'm really interested to hear your thoughts in the comments. Let me know if I missed anything, uh, as well as uh, what else you'd like to see me cover on this channel. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up and don't forget to share it. That stuff really helps me out. If you haven't subscribed yet, please go ahead and do that as well so you won't miss future uploads and click the bell icon to receive all notifications. If you want to support my work even further, becoming a member or a patron is a great way to do so. Links to those as well as my social media and my merch store are in the description below. That's about all I have for this week. Live long and prosper. Thank you.